talk about like a guy that's named Ahab a little bit. Uh, how many of y'all remember Ahab in the Bible? Was he known as a good king or a bad king? His wife was Jezebel, if that gives you any hint. He was a bad king. And who wore the pants or the tunic in that family? Jezebel pretty much. And she could scare off a, 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 a Elijah, the, the, the mighty prophet Elijah. Anyway, what happened to Ahab? He died. And he died just like the, the, the God said he would. He told it through, through a, uh, a prophet exactly what would happen. And it's kind of gross the way it wound up. But uh, that's, that's exactly what happened as it went through. If it was a true prophet of God, it was going to happen that way. Same again as we should talk about Revelation. It's going to happen that way. You can rest on it. So here's, here's what's going on. Ahab was the king of Israel. If you, if you remember, Israel was once one nation. And then it split. Israel was a state in the north. And Judah, where Jerusalem is, was in the south. Israel had no more good kings when, after they split. Judah had two or three. And one decent king was a guy named Jehoshaphat. But it says here, so the king of Israel, that's Ahab, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Rabbah of Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle. But you put on your robes, so the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Would you feel a little love set up by that if you were the visiting king? Who does the enemy want to shoot? The king. Ahab has a good plan. You dress up like the king, and I'll put on something else. And Jehoshaphat bought that. It is just kind of crazy that he would do that. Now the king of Syria had commanded 32 captains of his chariots. He says, fight no one great or small, only the king of Israel. Guess who was set up? So it was that when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, sure, it's the king of Israel. Therefore, they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat cried out. And it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel. I wonder what Jehoshaphat was crying out. Not me, not me. You know. Uh, anyway, it, it was not the king. said so they turned back from pursuing him. Now, here's the whole point of this verse. A certain man... Drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel, the real king, not the one dressed up, right? In the joints between his armor. Where did that arrow have to go? Not only did it have to find the right person in the opposing army, it's, he just shot it up at random and said, but it went between the joints of the armor. And he, Ahab, said to the driver, Turn around, take me out of the battle, for I'm wounded. The battle increased, didn't go well. They were fighting the Syrians. As the sun went down uh, throughout the army, everybody said, Every man to his city, every man to his, his house. It says, So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. But somebody washed the chariot. Here's where the prophecy came true. At the pool at Samaria, and the dogs licked up the blood. While the harlots bathed according to the word of God which he had spoken. Ugh. That's not the way you want to start off for lunch, is it? But, but that's what happened, what God said would happen. And, and similar stuff happened to his wife about 10 years later, uh, Jezebel. Well, here's the big question. How many of y'all have got, seen all the conspiracy theories about who killed JFK? The magic bullet and all those kind of things. Who shot that arrow? Anybody watch detective shows? The, some of the, the people that wrote the, the uh, commentaries back for the Jewish people way back in that day, they decided they know who it is. They think it's a guy named Naaman. Have you heard of him before? Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Syria. We don't know that it was him. But that's what they've decided. They wrote it in their, their things that they call They have like the Midrash and this and that. Their commentaries on the Old Testament. But they decided that it was probably Naaman. Who is he? Naaman's commander of the army of the king of Syria. And he was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. 
He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. I praise you, Father, for being in charge. Father, left to our own devices. Lord, we know where we would wind up. But you stepped in. You made the first move. You loved us. And Lord, so as we read this story about Naaman, Father, I pray that, Father, you, you open our hearts to the goodness of who you are and how you reach for us. And Father, we won't reject you. Father, not, not before we're Christians and then we come to recognize through, through your word, through your spirit, that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And Father, not afterwards, Lord, saved where we would reject your Holy Spirit as you seek to guide us, Father, through your word, through your spirit, to do things that you bring you honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He was a leper. The hero. Now, leprosy was a disease that they really didn't have a cure for. They, they had remedies that they said, if you were cured, but they really didn't have anybody that got cured back then. And so if you got it, it was one of those diseases that everybody dreaded. If you don't know, as you read through the Bible, they would literally have to stop and shout. They were, if you think we're in quarantine, they were in a quarantine. They would have to shout unclean at the top of their voice if they had it. So the fact that he had leprosy and he was still able to function means he must have had a little bit at the beginning or he's at the beginning stages. And the king, he was indispensable. He was going to let him fight on no matter what. So... Wow, but what a thing, because he, he literally had a death sentence on him while he's this mighty man of valor doing these amazing things. The, the other thing, though, is, is he's working for, the, he, he's a Syrian, or uh, Aramean. Uh, Aram was the name that they called Syria in, in the beginning days. So, A-R-A-M. Anyway, so your Bible may have that. Some of the, uh, the translations have Aram instead of Syria. But he was the <coughs> captain, hero. And, uh, and the Syrians had gone out on raids and they brought back a captive young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. You can go study the Bible and you find out that God was allowing Syria. Remember what I told you about those northern kings? How many were good God-fearing men? It depends on which God you're talking about. Ahab and them like to worship a lot of little G gods. Their name didn't start with a capital G. They started with little G. Uh, and I'm sure, that, in fact, we know that uh, Jezebel made sure that her gods were put up front. Remember, these are little G's. These are not a real God. There's God and there's the enemy who thinks he's a God and makes us believe in other gods. Or at least entices us to do that. It sways us is the word we used earlier. But he was attacking to punish. And God would use other nations to punish Israel when they got out of whack. And you know, if God loves you enough, guess what he'll do? He'll chastise you and I. To be sure that we don't go the wrong way. Because he knows what's at the end of that rope if we go the wrong way. So he loves us too much to let us go there without a fight. And so he will lovingly correct us. In fact, he says, if he doesn't correct us, we're, we're really not his kids. We're illegitimate. We're pretending to be something that we're not. But anyway, that some of those, by the way, same commentaries that the old uh, Jewish leaders had written said that the reason that he got this, we always want to blame somebody if something goes wrong. The reason he got the leprosy was because he took this Israel girl. Well, we know from God's word that God wanted Syria to harass the kings of the north. So we're not sure about that, but I, and you think about it. This young girl, what was she going through as a slave from an enemy country? Surely if God loved her, he wouldn't let her go to the foreign side, would he? Let's keep reading. Then she said to her mistress, this young girl, said to, to uh, Naaman's wife, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Samaria is the northern part or in, in the kingdom of Israel. For he would heal him of his leprosy. What kind of relationship did she have with this family? But she said, I know where your answer is. I know where your answer is. Let me ask you, Christians, have you ever got sent to a place that wasn't comfortable? Have you ever worked in a place that wasn't comfortable? If you're working with your boss, don't say nothing. If you're worshiping with your boss. But at the same time, have you ever, has that ever happened to you? You went to a place and you said, why am I here? It wasn't that you were running from God. You thought you were doing everything right and everything went wrong. And you wound up someplace that was just not comfortable at all. Would you say that's where this young girl was? 
a slave for the enemy. In fact, not just the enemy, but the hero of the enemy's side. Working for, for, her, for her wife as a slave. And what does she say to the, to the woman? There's a prophet in Israel who can heal your husband. Now, what does a prophet do? Gives the word of God. Amen. So the prophet is not powerful in their own right. They're only powerful because of the God they serve. And that's the point. You and I are to take the word of God out. We can't save anybody. But the word of God, it, it, I mean, Belzer explained by the Holy Spirit, can save everybody. If we would listen. Anyway, so she's there. She offers the remedy for something that's impossible to heal. Now, Naaman went in and told his master, who's Naaman's master? The king. Everybody works for somebody. Have y'all noticed that? He went to the king and said, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Well, the king, he don't want to lose his best player. Right? This isn't a game where there's just some uh, hurtful loss or, 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 or feeling bad because we lost the game. This is where people die if you don't win. And so he's got his best commander out there. And so I don't know how much he loved Naaman or cared about Naaman, but he sure didn't want to lose him. So the king of Syria said, go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him six talents of silver. How much is that? I'm excuse me, 10 talents of silver. I'm not doing good with numbers today. I did get the, the 6 o'clock change from the other. But 10 talents. Well, a talent is about 75 pounds. 75 pounds of silver. Looks like one of them Super Bowl rings. No, it's actually more, more than that. Right? But, but, so that'd be 750 pounds of, of silver. 6,000 shekels of gold. Gold has been almost $2,000 an ounce. I don't know how much, how many ounces is in the shekel, but uh, that's a lot, a lot of money. And ten changes of clothing. Seems like they, they, they don't really match up. What would you rather have? Uh, uh, several pounds of gold, or, or, or whatever, or ten changes of gold clothing? But you got to remember too, back then they didn't have a Woolworth. I'm sorry, we don't, we don't have a Woolworths now anymore, do we? Are they still out there? Anywhere, uh, wherever you buy your clothes, they didn't have that. They had to be handmade, so that was pretty valuable. Ten changes of clothes. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, said, "Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of leprosy." What would you think if you got that letter? Is somebody just sent a word to you that, that says uh, basically we're bigger than you we're better than you and your job is to go get one piece by tomorrow if you don't get it we're going to be mad that's basically what the letter said wasn't it they had been having trouble they weren't the winners because guess who has servants captured from the other side Syria does not Israel remember God is chastising Israel and so he's letting them win and so the king is, is not happy because he's asked to do something that's impossible. Have you had someone come in before and say to you that uh, we're going to take this town for Jesus. I want you knocking on doors and saving everybody in the house. Have you ever been put in that spot? It's implied. It's almost implied. And, and, and the problem is we don't want to go because we don't want to what? Fail. Who can I save on my own? Nobody. It's odd. The next chapter is about losing an axe head. And, and, and it falls in the river and it sinks. And, and they're all worried about that axe head. And how did that make the Bible? But the truth is, a, a, an axe without an axe head, how useful is it? You just bruise a bunch of trees and along with hands, don't you? You can imagine hitting it and shivering in your hand while your hand hurts and all that kind of stuff. And when we go out and try to do God's work without the effective part of who we are, which is God the Holy Spirit, we just will be all out there hitting on trees with axe handles. God has to do that. It's not something man can decide. We're going to go take this town for such and such. You're going to go save it. It doesn't work that way. God saves people. He uses you and I as a tool. And I pray that we're at least sharpened and ready to go when we've gotten close to God so that He can use us. We've got sensitive to what He would have us do. But anyway, this king is in a bad place. Now the problem is, Amongst others, remember, nobody's really healed anybody so far from, from that city. And number two, the girl said, go to the who? To the prophet of God. But the king is using his clout, and he went straight to 
The king. What, what was the king's uh, issue when he, he went from the king of Syria to the king of Israel to, to get it done? What was the problem there? The king of Syria thought that the king of Israel controlled the prophet. Wouldn't that what you think? Well, that's, he's the boss of the land. He, he's the preacher in the land. So he must control the prophet. I'm all for separation of church and state in many ways. But I'm not for pushing church out of government. Amen? And, and not having the morality that it brings, the seeking of God's wisdom that it brings, and all those other things. But as far as, is the church telling the government what to do, or the government telling the church? The problem is, it's all a bunch of people. And what happens when either one gets in charge? Sometimes people start acting like people and still listening to God. Have you noticed that? But the, the point of the whole thing was not that, that people could be uh, have a relationship with God and be in government. The problem was we didn't want government telling the church how to operate. We've we got that right here, don't we? King of Syria told the king of Israel, you better do it. And the, uh, the king of Israel knows better. He doesn't know enough because he doesn't think about what to do. But the king of Israel got scared when he read the letter. And he tore his clothes. Now we just spoke about how valuable they were. But that means you were grieving. You were mourning. You were upset. You would rip your clothes. We just throw stuff around the house. What do y'all do? When, when things aren't going right. Slam doors. We try not to do that as much as we used to. But anyway, he's doing that. Why? Because he's in a spot. He can't win. People don't get healed from lepers. And it happened when the, he tore his clothes and says, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a, a man to me to heal him of leprosy? And is that what's going to happen here? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel. He's trying to start something so he can come over here and really wipe us out instead of just raid us. If you need help that only God can give, skip the middleman. Amen? Skip the middleman. Skip the worldly advice and go directly to God. And, and what they had before they had the Bible was they had the prophets from God. Now you had a bunch of fake prophets that would tell you anything. That's really what got them in the chapter uh, where uh, uh, Ahab was killed in trouble. He listened to his fake prophet instead of the real one. Because the real one gave him some bad news. You follow your own mind, you're going to wind up in a bad place and dogs are going to be licking the blood. That's, that's what he told him. But Ahab followed his own mind and where did he wind up? Exactly as, as the prophet told him. But skip the middle man. So it was that when Elisha, I didn't say Elijah, I said Elisha. Who is Elisha? He's the, the one that Elijah passed the, the mantle or, or passed the, the office over to whenever he was taken by chariots. How many people in the Bible in the Old Testament were taken to, to heaven without a... To, or, or, to where God is without a, a dying? Just two. One in Genesis and, and this guy. Right? And the Bible says in Genesis, I mean Revelation, excuse me, that he's going to come back and do some work in Revelations. If you'd like to know more about that, see us on uh, Sunday or Wednesday. But anyway, uh, but Elisha is there, and Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, and he sent uh, to the king, says, why have you torn your clothes? Does he look kingly when he's throwing a fit? Do we look kingly when we're throwing a fit? No. Please let him come to me. And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now if there's a prophet in Israel, then there's the God that speaks to the prophet. Amen? So we've got an enemy commander who's come and made raids on Israel, taking captives, and now he's coming seeking healing from something that can't be healed. But word gets to the man of God. He said, send him to me. Now instead of the king telling Elisha what to do, who's leading? Who's leading? The guy with all the big robes and castles and soldiers? No, the man of God. It's interesting when you go read about Paul when he's riding the ship being hauled as a prisoner to Rome and the ship is sinking. 
At first they talked about throwing him overboard and this and that, but finally he starts telling them, no, what y'all need to do is this. This Sunday, the non-sailor is telling the people on the ship, this is what needs to happen so you can all be saved. And he became the leader. The guy in chains, right, became, became the leader because he was the man of God. I hit the stand too hard. He kicked back there. So, Naaman went with his horses and chariot and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. What do you think he expected? I don't think Elisha had guarded gates to get into his house. And he lived a pretty humble life. You know why? We, we learned about it this morning. Do you know that if you have Christ, you're already more than a conqueror. Everything in the, in the earth has been won by you that you can get and take with you out of this earth. Did you know that? Now, I'm sorry, you can get some more rewards, but you do that by loving obedience to God and, and through, through that. But as far as the salvation, you've got that. And, and people that don't have that have nothing they take with them except condemnation. They chose to stay in condemnation. So David went with horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. Well, that would have been great news. If what? One, if it were true. And it is. And two, if you believe. No matter if it's true or not, if you don't believe it, then where do you wind up? Not going. It's right there. I often share with people when, when, when we're talking about how to be saved. You know, the wages of sin is death, right? But the free gift of, of God is what? Life, eternal life through Christ Jesus. And so it's, the gift is there. But people walk right by and say, I don't do that religious stuff. I'm not, I'm not into that church stuff. And you know how some of the people at church are, they just look at you funny. And others of us are just funny look. You know, whatever it is, it, we have a thousand excuses why we just leave that gift there and don't touch it. Here's Naaman's. Naaman became furious. <laughs> why was he mad? Remember, he was a hero. Well thought of. And the prophet wouldn't even come out of the door. He walked all that way. Went and saw a king. He went up there. Hey, hey what did he get a message out the door? You go to, this is the big thing. His whole life's involved. I wonder how, how much he worried about having this leprosy and what it's going to do to his family and, and all these others. Who else might catch it from him? All, all those things. And, and then kind of anticlimactic, the guys that go to the river over there and, and, uh, and, and get dumped seven times and you'll be okay. Do you know how many times I can share Romans 10 9? If anybody knows how many times it's y'all, for 22 years you've been here at least once a Sunday, if not several times, right? But confess with your mouth, Jesus is your Lord. Believe it in your heart. It has to be genuine. That God raised you from the dead and you shall be saved. And, and you know what? I, I've even heard it on the news before. Those evangelicals, what's an evangelical? People that go and tell people how to go to heaven instead of hell. Oh, those are mean people. Because if you hear it now, it's said with a slur on the news. And they'll go to somebody with a long bunch of initials after the name, the, the Reverend such and such with 17 initials, PhD, THD, SYD, whatever it is. Right? And they'll say, well, there's more to it than that. Well, there's more to it in the sense here you're going to keep living and you treat him as Lord the rest of your life as best you can and he'll help you with that. Remember, he chastises folks that he loves. Right? But as far as going to heaven, he's already given the prophecy, if you do this and if you do that, you shall be saved. It's, it's a done deal. We studied that all morning in, in Sunday school. Said so you can know that you are saved. Now, it has to be a hard thing. It can't be some religious just spouting off some words. When it says that in the Bible, I'm going to say the magic words. It's not that. It has to be from the heart. Right? But you can know that you say, That's, well, there's more to it than that. Or you go back in the Old Testament and, and you read, and we're in the Old Testament even further back, and you find out about those who were rebelling against God and against Moses. And what did God do? He let a bunch of fiery serpents be out there. 
And the people were dying as they got bit by the snakes. They were being chastised because they had God taken care of and they didn't appreciate it. And so what did God say? They will make a fake snake, a bronze snake, and put it up on the pole. And if they'll just look at it, they'll be all right. Well, how dumb is that? You just look at the, the, the very thing that's supposed to be biting you. Right? And you're going to be saved from the, the, the venom and all that. That doesn't, make, that doesn't make sense at all. Don't you trust the science? That's not an anti-venom. You think we're unsophisticated? We don't know any better? But guess what? Those that looked at the serpent on the pole lived, and those that didn't die. Because who's in charge? Who's sovereign? God is. And, and what did Jesus say? Like the serpent... On the pole, those who look at the Christ on the pole, when He's lifted up, will be saved. Listen, if God said it, you don't have to add to it. In fact, you better not. Amen? And so, God's Word through the prophet says, you go to the river right over there, the Jordan River, dip seven times, and you'll be cleansed. Got to be more to it than that. He tells you people know better. And I'm being facetious. Wise people say, I trust you, God. So Naaman got furious and went away and said, Indeed. I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on my name for the Lord and wave his hand over the place and heal this leper. He's going to do some big show to show. Now, I can't believe this guy. He's a fake. He's a fraud. He doesn't have the entourage. He doesn't have the showmanship. Something is wrong to make this happen. God made some awfully big shows in this time and people didn't pay any attention. God made a major showing in you and I whenever we accepted Jesus and He sealed us until the day of redemption. And it's kind of secret because it's pretty intimate. It's between you and God. But then He said, now you go share it. And you and I aren't showmen either. However, the Holy Spirit should show through us. Amen. Our trust in Jesus Christ, our relationship should show. We should live as victors. As it said in the Sunday school lesson this morning, God doesn't want us living around wondering if we're saved or not, trying to go through this life. And we're here to show people what it's like to follow Jesus Christ and already be more than a conqueror. You and I outrank Naaman. He hasn't conquered leprosy yet. He hasn't even conquered his own emotions yet, has he? He's lost in his disease and his hopelessness. Then he goes this way. Are not Abinai and the far, far far the rivers of Damascus, Damascus is in Syria, better than all the waters of Israel? Is this a pretty prideful guy? My dog's bigger than your dog is about the same as this, this argument. Right? Our rivers are better than that Jordan thing over there. It's mud. And it's in Israel. That just makes no sense. There got to be more to it than that. Could I not wash in them and be clean? Then he turned and went away in a rage. He's probably pretty hurt. He thought he was going to get fixed right then and there. And it was going to be a big celebration. And everything was going to happen. And, and, and now he doesn't trust it. But he's already traveled from Syria, hasn't he? He's gone to the king. He's gone to the other guy. And his servant spoke, verse 13, and came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, you know, go slay a dragon, something like that, would you not have done it? How much more then if he says to you, why should he be I mean, if you put a big thing, if you conquer this country, you slay a dragon, you do this, that, you'd be out there going after it. All he did was go ask you to wash seven times. In a river that's closer to us than them others that you just mentioned, this is his servants. This is his servants. What do you think? I'm going to have to quit getting this taken. And so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan. He had to step across his walk before he could go to that river in Israel. His pride. His disappointment. Right? Things weren't going. He, he wasn't in charge. He's used to being in charge. Can you imagine how it felt to go one time under the water and come up and everything still looked the same? Two times? 
If he was frustrated before he got there, you think, I mean, you should be able to see something happen. Huh? We're studying the number seven in Revelations. And it's a number that we come to remember in the Bible. It's a number of completion. Seven days in a week. Seven years in a Sabbath year. Seven times of seven in, in, in a Jubilee time before you got to the Jubilee year. And you get that all the way through the Bible. And, and so it basically means 100%. Uh, if we have something that is horrible as cancer, how much of it do we want gone? Do we want one seventh of it gone? Do we want two sevenths? Is it okay if we get six sevenths gone of cancer? How much do we want gone? All of it. All of it. And so how many times did he dip in, in this, this, this river? We got to be at the Jordan River, you know. This, this idea of completion is kind of important because at the Jordan River, I got to baptize 15 people. Many had already been baptized once. You only need once. Because it says, what well, I'm on the team. I'm following Christ. Right? But it's not always gnawed at me. I was baptized at 14. And, and you, you have doubts. Shouldn't you say to say it? You know? But you have these doubts. Did I do it? Uh, knowing what I know now. Would I do it again? All those other kind of things. But well, we got to go to the Jordan River. And guess who baptized me? Brother Charles. Guess who the first person I baptized was? Brother Charles. I'm on up on it though because I got to baptize him again in the Jordan River. But, but it, it was, it, it took all that doubt out of my way. I, I didn't have to wonder about that anymore. Does that make sense? You only need one baptism. But it was good to know that I did it as an adult because I wanted to. Believer's baptism, a, a step further. Now I wasn't more saved, but it just gave me that peace of mind. It wasn't between me and God. It felt like I completed something. Like that, that seven times seven. You know, those kind of things, those, those numbers. And, and I remember uh, as we went in to, to go, there was one young lady uh, of Asian descent. She was uh, further up stream. And she sat there, and I saw her baptize herself. She was about 20 years old, and, and she'd stand there, and she'd say something to God. And, she could, and I don't know how many times she did, but I wonder if it wasn't seven times. You know, because it was something. Now listen, that water is no more holy than the water we get from Thornwood. Amen? What was holy about what's going on here is his obedience to God and to his work and doing it completely. Not six times, not six and a half times, but seven times. And it may not make any kind of sense to a lost world. It's just scientifically that just couldn't work. Right? And yet, what happened with Amy? He went down and dipped seven times according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a child. What happens is our skin gets older. I don't know if you notice on you, but I notice on me. It's not the same as it was when I was a child. It gets thin. It sure does. It doesn't take much to make it leave. Right? Scars and all that kind of stuff uh, that, that happens. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Just once. Just once. But that, that, that was the instructions. Now the, the, his instructions were a little different than mine. He's not being baptized to be saved. He's being baptized to be healed of leprosy. Right? Uh, so, how much more then, when he says to you, wash and be clean, uh, he says, and so what happened? He did it and he was clean and it. He came out with his, his skin like that of a child. And he returned to the man of God with all of his age. He came and stood before him. And he says, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Is there wrong with taking a gift? No, but in this case there was. Paul talked about pastors being worth, worth their pay and all that. But Paul wouldn't take money in certain places. He was a tent maker and knows why. What was the whole point of God bringing somebody from a foreign nation? By the way, who did you get the word from? A Jewish girl with no clout. She's a slave. He got the word of God. He followed the word of God. And now where is he? Where, where do you and I get our instructions? So Jewish people 
who, who kept this word of God carefully, wonderfully. And, and because of that, and the prophetic words given to us here, we too can be saved, cleansed of our sins. Which is trickier than cleansing leprosy. Amen? Way trickier than cleansing leprosy. So we can see God is, is saying something here. He says, I know there's no God on all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift. And he said, as God lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Elisha said, I don't want your money. I'm not in the business. I'm in the ministry. There's a difference between the two. Amen? Then he said, if not, please let your servant uh, be given two mule loads of earth for your servant. He's talking about himself now. For your servant will no longer uh, either... Uh, offer either burnt offerings or sacrifice to any other little g gods. You see that? God spelled with little g, but only to the Lord. What's He want the earth for on the mules? When He kneels down, He wants to remember where He was. They call those places we went over there the Holy Lands. Where's the holiest place on earth right now? In the heart of every Christian. That's where the Holy of Holies is now. That's where the Holy Spirit dwells. The center of every Christian. Remember, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We studied that verse this morning. Right? In Ephesians 1.13. When you believe, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's the holy place. But he wants to remember and not forget that he's found the one true God. He says, I'm not worshiping anything else. He said, yeah, this one thing, Lord, pardon your servant. When, when my master goes into the temple of Rimlon, little G God, to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimlon, when I bow down to the temple of Rimlon, may the Lord please pardon your servant this thing. He says, I'm not bowing down for them. I'm just doing my job. Please don't hold that against me. And what did Elisha say? He says, go in peace. Then he departed a short distance away. What did we learn from this? Who loved this guy? Who was a warrior? God did. To what extreme would he go so he could be saved? Allow a, a, a little girl from Israel to be taken captive. And then, you've heard from the mouth of a child? From the mouth of, of this young girl came the word for salvation which pointed to God. He went and he had to get over himself to be saved of leprosy. But also, we recognize that he's given up all other gods and he serves one. He didn't just add another God onto his list. He says, nothing else. Only this one God. Did God reveal himself to him? He could sing that song, Oh, how I love. He didn't know Jesus' name at the time. But Jesus, because he first loved me. He could sing that song. He looked beyond my faults. I was an arrogant enemy warrior against the people of God. He looked beyond that and he loved even me. Amen? He loved even me. And if you wonder if God's in control, you think He had any wonder about that after that part? He had in His mind how things ought to work. We never get there, I know. But God says, no, this is how I'm doing this. Because God makes the rules. God is the truth. And so when we deviate from God's way, we deviate from the truth. And everything else is a lie. If it's a true prophet of God, and wonderfully we have the true prophecy of God, you can count on it. You can stand on it. Are we going to let this enemy warrior not love God from Christians who are the bride of Christ? We don't have to sneak around and, and play a silly games with the king because it's our, our, our job in that way. We might have to make some augmentations on our job, but we can still present because we have the Holy Spirit. We've already won. At that time, they didn't get the Holy Spirit living in them like we do now. Before Christ was on the, before Christ was crucified and, and, and resurrected. We get that at Pentecost, that again. Right? You don't know how special and what a special place you're in to have all of this that God's given us. That's just a little picture of it. The problem is we don't own it. And because we don't own it, we don't always live it. And when we don't live it, God isn't glorified and people see us and in fact encourage us to be like their best, just be a victim in this world. As opposed to more than a conqueror through Christ who gives us all the strength. 
My prayer is we go out of here victorious. And we get to remember those people that wrote those old songs. I know they're old. I know they're not up with all the latest this and that. But I can tell you what, the words are amazing. Oh, how I love Jesus because He first loved me. What a friend I have in Jesus. He loved me in spite of me. He looked beyond my, my junk, my faults. And He loved me. And He made me more than a conqueror. A couple of things. If you're not a Christian, goodness, why not? You think because all the cool kids play on the other team? Look who the captain of the other team is. And look where he's going to be. If you don't know, join us for the Revelation study. It's not, it's not pretty. Right? But, but if you're on the, the team of Christ, don't stop at six times whatever he's asking you to do. Go to the seventh. Amen? Don't, don't say, uh, I'm having my Christianity right here. I'm good enough. I'm satisfied. Don't do that. Something body, you step through it. You know, if you think such way, you can step through it. Right? I'm talking about what God shows you to do. What He says in His Word. Don't say I'm comfortable. This is enough. I am so glad my Jesus didn't say, well, that's enough for old Daryl. I'll just get a pink mail, Jesus said, for old Daryl. He's not worth dying for. <laughs> suffering for. Amen? Spilling my blood for. What did He hold back from Daryl? What did the Father hold back? Not His only begotten Son. What's the Holy Spirit? Poor Holy Spirit. Don't you feel for the Holy Spirit? He got to walk around with Daryl 24-7. And wherever Daryl goes, I drag him. Wonderfully, God doesn't see it that way, but you think about it. How many of you know people that no matter how much you love, you don't want to hang with them 24-7? And go to every place they want to go and stuff like that. You want to see the loving commitment. God has put it on His people. Amen. And then He's planning a celebration. The, the wedding supper of the bride of Christ. If He didn't hold back for us. Remember what seven means? Complete. 100%. If we love Him, we'll obey a little bit. If we love Him a little bit, that might be it. If we love Him, we'll obey Him. How many times are we supposed to forgive? Seventy times seven. What was He saying? hundred percent times hundred percent. All the time. Because that's how many times He forgives you and me. So Christians, be the happy army that we can be. The joyous army that we can be. The army that is not out there to play the world's game, but do it as the Father's instructing. Let's go to the Lord.